The main donation is everything in the income department, too. But as often as not, your best ideas will come from other people. Other people can make you rich if you listen to them. Other people not only have everything we want as far as income is concerned and will gladly give it to us if we learn it, they also have the ideas we need if we we'll listen to them. Time and again during my business life, the ideas of others have proved to be of enormous value. One idea given to me many years ago by an acquaintance earned my company several million dollars. Another idea, a suggestion at lunch by another acquaintance, resulted in my daily radio program. Another idea worth millions. Others often see things we can do better than we can. We're often too close to ourselves and tend to take ourselves for granted. I don't mean that we should follow every suggestion made to us, not by any means. But every once in a while, someone can drop a handful of diamonds in our lap. We must still follow through with the idea, put it together, cover it with the necessary investment of time, thought, talent, and money. But without the suggestion, we might never have thought of it ourselves. Personal renewal demands that we maintain an open, free-flowing idea system, and we should be as free with our good ideas for others as we are in examining those passed along to us by friends and acquaintances. One idea can make us rich, so that we can then turn to the things we most want to do if what we most enjoy is not connected with our work. To accomplish anything, as W. McNeil Dixon writes in his interesting book, The Human Situation, you need an interest, a motive, a center for your thoughts. You need a star to steer by, a course, a creed, an idea, a passionate attachment. Men have followed many guiding lights. They've been inspired by love of fame and love of country. They've pursued power, wealth, holiness. They've followed Christ, Mohammed, Napoleon. Something must beckon you or nothing is accomplished. Something about which you ask no questions. Thought needs a fulcrum for its lever. Effort demands an incentive or an aim. We need to know our motive. I know mine, I think. Do you know yours? What makes following our ideas so interesting are the unexpected paths and byways and windfalls that occur along the way, the serendipitous events that unfailingly come to the person in pursuit of a goal. Serendipity means the faculty of making happy and unexpected discoveries by accident. The word was coined by the British author Horace Walpole, who based it on the title of an old fairy tale, The Three Princes of Serendip. The princes in the story were always making interesting discoveries while on a quest for something else. The secret of making serendipitous discoveries is to make certain we're following a star, a cause, a creed, or an idea. It's the secret of what the uninitiated call good luck. Just as ideas and imagination are the fountain of youth, being on a personal quest absolutely guarantees that unexpected good fortune will come our way from time to time. Whenever you hear of someone being lucky, a little investigation will show that the person is a busy, positive kind, looking for new and interesting ways of doing things. I remember reading that good luck is what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. People who pull in their heads and try to play it safe seldom learn about serendipity. Perhaps they wouldn't recognize it if it sat on their doorstep. The next time you hear someone say, don't stick your neck out, observe him closely. Chances are he's a rather dull and uninteresting person with little to recommend him. Sticking your neck out is the way to woo serendipity. A friend of mine, Skipper Hill of Miami, named his big trawler Yacht Serendipity. A lot of boredom and frustration that's connected with work comes from not knowing more about it. Lurking somewhere within every line of work, there is tremendous opportunity. And if we'd only find a star to steer by, a goal worth working toward, we'll see more of it. One of the greatest explorers who ever lived, Captain James Cook, began as an ordinary seaman. In just four years, he had learned enough to become a master of his own ship and to later make the discoveries that made him famous. A happy, successful, serendipitous life began as a common seaman. The people who find a meaning, a deeper purpose in their work, find themselves deluged by good fortune. I suppose that's why just 5% of the people earn 40% of all the money in the country. What is the star by which I steer my life? A good question to ask from time to time. It may change as we mature and sort out the important from the unimportant, but a person without a goal is like a ship without a rudder. I talked to a class of kids in distributive education in Milwaukee not long ago, and afterwards a couple of fine, serious young men came backstage and asked, but what if we don't have a goal? And I suggested that they make the finding of a worthy goal their goal. It seemed to help. Another common seaman, Joseph Conrad, studied and worked his way to become a ship's captain. 
He later spent the long weeks at sea writing his great classic stories. Serendipity. We can put it to work in our lives whenever we wish. All we need is a quest, an odyssey, which is the name of my boat, incidentally. If you'd like to know more about the interesting subject of motivation, what motivates people today and what doesn't, by all means read the book I mentioned earlier, The Enjoyment of Management by John Price. He points out that motivating people has been with us for centuries. The five classic forms of motivation were practiced by such legendary greats as Cleopatra, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, and Moses. And for many centuries, these five motivators, pay, direction, discipline, underutilization, and diversion, work magnificently. Moses crossed the wilderness, Caesar conquered Gaul, and Cleopatra had her wily way. So naturally, these heretofore highly efficient motivators continued into the Industrial Revolution and are still with us today. But do they still motivate? Well, let's see. Pay is income to the person for use as he determines, but he's influenced by a couple of things. Does he have full freedom to use pay in any manner he wants, or must he use all or part of it to fill obligatory demands such as the rent, car payments, the phone bill, and taxes? There isn't as much discretionary income there as some think. Pay in most people's minds is their due for the work they perform. It does not tend to change a person's behavior from median to maximum performance. Pay, then, is not a motivator. It motivates membership, and that's all. Money is what the employer uses to attract and hold people. It motivates them to come or to leave an organization, not to perform to the maximum of their ability. Denial of aspirations for independence of action through detailed direction will certainly motivate changes in organizational behavior. Unfortunately, the motivation will take a negative tack, leading to dissension and withdrawal of individual effort. Discipline, the third classic motivator, still works, but it's much more difficult to apply today. The unions, changes in lifestyles, the lesser emphasis on material goals, all have contributed to a weakening of discipline as a motivational force. The biggest problem in our industrial society today, without qualification, is the underutilization of people in the workforce. It is, in itself, a monumental deterrent to maximum individual productivity. But far worse, it has a relationship with just about every aspect of the work situation. Pay, discipline, direction, to cite the motivators we've already discussed, and also the full range of organizational goals, profit, production, morale, and so forth. The major effect of underutilization is turnover. And turnover, as any industrial leader will tell you, is the bane of his existence. The most talented young people, aware of the fact that they're not being fully utilized, quit. The young man has grown up without the problem or frustrations of his older boss who remembers the Depression. He's of a generation unique in sociological history, a generation without substantive problems of personal survival. Often the young men who stay are generally of a less aggressive nature who eventually will extend the minimum of effort, which ultimately becomes fixed. If they're unable to channel their unused abilities elsewhere, they will, according to Parkinson's law, shrink to fit the job. And finally, diversion, getting people's minds off the unpleasant job, is fast becoming passe. So the five classic motivators that have been around since Moses, Julius Caesar, and Cleopatra are pay, direction, discipline, underutilization, and diversion. But in the rapidly changing world of today, they don't seem to work anymore. John Price tells us about five more, the stable motivators, which do. They are growth, achievement, responsibility, recognition, and work nature. First, growth. Growth is of two types, organizational growth and self-developmental growth. For the person to feel meaning in his job and thus give to that job the full measure of his ability requires that he sense the opportunity for promotion beyond his present job, organizational growth, and opportunity for the advancement of his own personal competence. He will, of course, sense opportunity only if there are, in fact, recognizable mechanisms for its realization. These mechanisms, quite simply, are discretionary awards, succession planning procedures, merit increase provisions, and personal development programs. Two, achievement. According to some professionals in human behavior, is the most important of the needs for the organizational member. Unless the person senses that what he's doing is a contribution to a greater goal, that he is doing something that counts, he will very likely produce mediocrity. Three, a sense of responsibility is third of the five motivational needs which must be satisfied for maximum job performance. 
We do not, as a rule, delegate to people the freedom to act as responsible managers of their own jobs. Everybody is a manager if we think of management as involving the coordination of resources. So creating a feeling of importance and responsibility is the job of the manager today. And unless this feeling is created in the individual, one of the important elements will have been lost. Four, recognition. The five most important words in the language are, I am proud of you. The four most important, what is your opinion? The three most important, if you please. And the two most important, thank you. These are all simple phrases, and they're pretty inexpensive ways to recognize individual performance with personal concern. Five, the last ingredient in the high-performance recipe is work content, the nature of the job itself. Unless the person has a basic liking for the functions, the tasks, the mechanics, or the work he performs, he cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, be motivated to perform at his highest achievement level. I don't mean to imply that the person who doesn't consider his work hobby-like is lost, motivationally speaking, but he must be in agreement with himself, if only subconsciously, on the fundamental desirability of what he's doing. No one can induce this last element. It must be there. We've always tended to look outside for the causes and solutions to the problems that confront us, rather than searching introspectively. You don't make an engine run better by polishing the block. Internal care is what counts. Now I'd like to quote something written by a business consultant friend of mine, Lawrence Harbeck, and published by the Wall Street Journal under the title, Some Plain Truth About Profit. I found it interesting not only for its valuable insights into the economics of free enterprise and the profit system, but also for the clarity with which they're presented, the almost total absence of professional jargon and technical gobbledygook. Free enterprise acknowledges human selfishness and directs it to constructive goals. Partisans of free enterprise claim this is a virtue. They believe selfishness is a fact of life. Opponents express horror at this pragmatic view. They believe government can eliminate human imperfection. Profit brings into sharpest focus the fight between the free enterprise and socialism-communism. The battle lines seem to be clear, but they're not. Profit is a deceptive subject, and on no other topic are friends of free enterprise less convincing. Practical businessmen state forthrightly that profit makes the wheels go round. Opponents think they already know this too well, and the fact torments them. Academic proponents of free enterprise unintentionally encourage two negative inferences in their usual argument. They imply that profit exists only in a free enterprise system, and only there because of imperfections, and that the profit motive is synonymous with selfishness. For example, many textbooks say, profit is money left after cost is subtracted from selling price. This definition is narrowly accurate, but broadly misleading. It sounds as if the seller is getting something for nothing. If the costs are met, why should there be a remainder? It implies by omission that profit is associated only with money and sales-oriented economic systems. Economic experts agree to disagree. They describe profits variously as high earnings from entrepreneurship, discrepancies arising from uncertainty, results of a monopoly position, return from a contrived scarcity, unnecessary surplus, implicit interest, rent, and wages, an accounting residual needed to balance earnings against the value of goods and services, and a mixture of these. None of this is helpful. As the profit concept is widely misunderstood, or understood diversely, and an emotional issue, it must be approached with precision. A simple economic model is needed to permit discussion in basic English and short words. Tradition is helpful. It calls for economic analysis to begin with Robinson Crusoe. Consider the lone castaway. He has drinking water, but no food. At rest, his body uses material and energy equivalent to one fish per day. If he does not eat one fish per day, while resting, he will starve. He must work to catch fish. Now, he pays a price for each day's effort. The price is extra material and energy used by his body while fishing. His efforts, successful or not, require a second fish each day. If he catches two fish each day, he will live. If his catch averages less than two, he will die. If he catches a third fish one day, it is profit. He can afford to rest the next day and not fish at all, or he can keep working and save his extra fish for the day when he gets less than two. Or he can start to build a supply to allow him to stop fishing temporarily and make a net to improve his productivity. The extra fish, the profit, gives him the option of doing something other than fishing. 
Time is a factor in measuring profit. The preceding discussion defines it over a 24-hour day. We can also define it as occurring only during production and conclude that the castaway makes a profit of one fish every eight-hour working day that he catches two. It gives him the option of not fishing at night. The significant point is this. During a productive period, however defined, he produced more than he consumed. Profit is the difference between production and consumption of the producing unit while it is producing. Now, all living things and all organizations of living things must be profitable to exist. Bears, squirrels, and trees must make a profit in the summer to survive the winter and start producing again next spring. Life survives unprofitable periods only if production exceeded consumption during an earlier period. Profit achieved during eight hours enables the worker to not work the remaining 16 hours of the day. The worker's profits permit his children to not work at all. Profit during good times, if not all removed, enables the business and the jobs it provides to continue during bad times. Profit is needed to start an enterprise. In your business, a bear cub and a plant seed owe their lives to profits generated before their birth. They could not come into existence or continue to exist at first while still unprofitable unless some other producer first generated a profit. Profit should not be confused with savings. Living things must save, if only in the form of fat, to survive profitless periods. But before they can save, they must profit. The real argument between free enterprise and socialism and communism is not about profit per se. All systems must profit to exist. The contentious issues are these. Who produces it? Who gets it? How is it used? And how are these decisions reached? Opinion on these questions should be developed and evaluated in the bright light of one glaring fact. No one gets it if there isn't any. Profit must precede allocation. It's pointless to give food stamps to poor people if farmers don't produce more food than farmers eat. Persons in government can't give a subsidy to an unprofitable activity unless they are first able to take a profit from some other enterprise. The total subsidy of some units of an economic system cannot exceed the profits of the others. Now, this hard fact applies equally to the castaway, families of bears, the United States, and all other nations, no matter what their economic and political structures. Nations living on the international dole are not exceptions. They're parts of larger economic systems. The finer things in life, sports, vacations, better homes, art, and so forth, and the so-called free things, welfare payments, low cost to the user, government housing, foreign aid, and so forth, are possible only if profits occur first. It seems reasonable, therefore, that current profits should be distributed in a manner designed to encourage the continued and increasing availability of future profits. To achieve this objective, an economic system must take into account many things, including a few facts of human nature, such as, you cannot destroy incentive. You cannot stop the superior individual's efforts to excel his fellow men. With taxes, laws, and regulations, you may be able to destroy his incentive to make a profit, but this forces him to express his superiority through less productive actions. People expect to benefit directly and commensurately from their own productivity. Within the limits of their profitability, they provide for their families. Few are willing to give a large share of their profit to strangers. All saints appear from time to time, but most of us do not qualify. Organizations based on the assumption that humans are saintly or can be taught or legislated to be saintly do not function as planned. They change or cease to exist. Often they become totalitarian in an effort to force people to be saintly. Precisely half the people are below average in ability. As a group, they produce much less than half of total profit. They are willing but unable. These underachievers must be given a greater share of profit than they produce or, in their frustration, they will diminish or destroy total profitability. They can do this by vote or direct action. They're not stupid. Given a chance to understand the choice, they will elect to dine on 25% of a turkey rather than 50% of a sparrow. Free enterprise comes closest to balancing these and other items, many of them conflicting, and is the most productive economic system. Idealists who confuse profits and selfishness often follow this pattern. They avoid profit-making jobs, seek profit-using careers, and clamor simultaneously for government action to prevent others from generating profits. 
The analogy would be to destroy part of the food and water in a lifeboat because the rowers are getting larger shares than those who cannot or will not help row the boat to safety. If someone wants to help the poor, he should start a new enterprise or work with an existing one to create more jobs and profits. The extra jobs and increased production will provide more help than will militant marching and loud mouth sympathy. If a person hopes to use profits as a government employee or a social worker, for example, he should be sure that his political actions do not discourage efficient producers from supplying the profits that permit him to appear altruistic. He should support the economic system that can best support him and those he wishes to help. Free enterprise is superior to socialism and communism in many ways, including profitability. It is not superior because it is profitable, however, but because it is more profitable. When John D. Rockefeller was in his 50s, making a million dollars a week, he was told by his physician that unless he changed his living habits, he wouldn't be around much longer to enjoy his rapidly accumulating fortunes. The doctor gave Mr. Rockefeller three simple pieces of advice, and, as is often the case, in their simplicity, was woven a profound wisdom. This is what Mr. Rockefeller was told. One, push yourself away from the table while you're still a little bit hungry. Two, stop worrying. And three, get some regular physical exercise. And that was it. Now, I'd imagine if you went to your doctor to get a complete medical checkup using the latest diagnostic equipment, and if you were given the same advice as Mr. Rockefeller, you'd check off your doctor as a country quack and go out in search of some more sophisticated recommendations. Well, you needn't do that. For there were sophisticated recommendations in the threefold prescription given to John D. Rockefeller, and he recognized them. His doctor, in a sense, was a prophet. Strange as it may seem, the health of modern Western man is being destroyed by three things. Overeating, excessive worrying, and a sedentary existence. In the next two issues of Direct Line, I'll be talking about the problems of obesity and anxiety as they relate to health. But for now, let's see if we can get some of the sitters out there off their seats and onto their feet. Let's explore together the possibilities available in our daily lives for increased physical activity. As nearly as I've been able to figure it, there are just four basic ways in which a person can find the physical activity his body needs to function at its best. If you can think of others, you might let me know, but for now, here are the four. The first way is through our daily work. We can get regular physical activity through our work. But the problem is, who works for a living anymore? What I mean, of course, is who toils for a living anymore. Chances are you probably don't, for the opportunities for making a living through physical labor are rapidly disappearing. Don't misunderstand me. I don't mean you don't work hard. You probably work very hard at your job. But what I'm asking is how much muscular strength or endurance does it take to accomplish your work successfully? What demand is put on your heart and lungs? What amount of caloric expenditure is required in your daily occupation? The answer for nine out of ten of us is simply that my work does not provide enough physical activity to meet the requirements for keeping my body dynamically healthy. Now, historically, this is a new development. For thousands of years, man had to toil for his livelihood. But even with the fitness rewards from physical labor being what they are, I'm sure we wouldn't care to go back to those conditions. Today, in order to offset the loss of physical activity that has beset man in this era, we need to find a suitable substitute for physical work. And that's where the other three ways come in. The second way to increase physical activity, and the most obvious, is through a planned exercise program. This can include joining a group at the YMCA, the Park and Recreation Department, or at your local community center. Or it could be a personal program of regular calisthenics, yoga, jogging, or any of a number of other activities pursued at your local health club or in and around your home. These are the activities most people think of when you mention the word exercise. But calisthenics, jogging, yoga, or isometrics should never by themselves be equated with the much broader term exercise. As fine and helpful as these activities are, they also have an important drawback. They're boring. There's nothing very exciting about staring at your navel for 15 minutes or grunting your way through 25 sit-ups. Yes, they're boring, especially when you're working at them alone without the experience to interject variety. It's formal exercises like these that cause most of our exercise dropouts. As valuable as they can be to any person, and most people will tell you they never feel better than when they're working out, 
It still takes a special kind of person to be faithful to a program that turns out to be little more than tedious work. But exercise that is vigorous physical activity need not be tedious. This brings us to the third way to get increased physical activity into our lives. The most palatable form of exercise is through sports and recreation. Besides the pure fun of what you're doing, there are tremendous rewards that come from activities like swimming, backpacking, tennis, handball, cycling, badminton, square dancing, judo, skiing, volleyball, and other activities which are strenuous enough to condition you while you're enjoying the participation. Developing a high level of personal fitness requires forming exercise habits, and what habits are easier to develop than those that are fun? Investigate the opportunities available in your community. If you're not familiar with a certain sport and you feel you might enjoy it, there are probably instruction courses available somewhere. If not, there are usually people more than willing to teach you their favorite activity if you just show the interest. But sports, with all of their positive values, do take extra time and often require special facilities. The last of our ways of getting more exercise requires neither of these. This family of exercise opportunities is called built-ins. They can be the answer to a frantically busy person finding the time to do it. Anyone can put built-ins into many of his daily routine tasks. Sandwich them in regularly, and they become a habit, and they take no additional time. Let me give some examples. Try holding your stomach in whenever you're waiting for a red light, or while you're walking. How about riding an exercise bike while you're watching television? Why not use the time it takes to draw your bath water for doing sit-ups or push-ups? One of my exercise friends has a routine he follows each morning while he's getting ready for work. It includes half-knee bends while he's brushing his teeth rising on his toes while washing his face and lathering his beard, toe-touching and stretching while the wash basin is filling, and isometric exercises for his stomach, seat, and legs while shaving. By the way, he also performs isometrics while he's listening to his direct-line tapes. Sounds strange? Well, it really isn't. It's simply using to the best advantage that most precious commodity of all, time. With a little imagination, you can find the same kinds of opportunities to add physical activity to your routine functions. You just have to think active. Now, any one of the four areas mentioned, your work, formal exercise, sports and recreation, and build-ins, could provide you with adequate activity to maintain a high state of physical fitness. But the most successful and lasting activity program will undoubtedly combine all four. It takes some planning and commitment but you can reach whatever level of activity and fitness you really desire. Remember, physical fitness is an unusual commodity. You can't buy it, borrow it, or steal it. And once you have it, you can't even store it. To possess it, you must make regular activity a daily habit and physical exertion a part of your life. John D. Rockefeller did. He took the advice of his physician in all three areas. He watched his diet. He sought a more positive approach to problem solving to eliminate worry and he engaged in physical activity almost daily until he was 90 years of age. These three simple yet profound suggestions given to John D. Rockefeller by his physician turned his life from one of deteriorating health to one of dynamic living. And you know, that way of life is available to each of us. Now to close direct line two, here's an idea if you've been wanting to get away from it all and have the time to get some good ideas. Take your family on a trip around the world. It was done not long ago by a 39-year-old telephone equipment maintenance man. He was what seemed to be a very average man with a very average family, working a very average paying job to make ends meet. But the man and his wife decided to take the whole family on a trip around the world, so they sold practically everything they owned, including their home. It produced $8,500, as I recall, 7000 of which they used on the trip. They boarded a freighter, sailed to Hawaii, the Fiji Islands, then Australia, then a 43-day trip by passenger liner around Australia to Ceylon, India, Arabia, the Suez Canal, that was before the Middle East problem, through the Mediterranean to southern France, Gibraltar, London, and so on. They got home with nothing but $1,500 and the will to start all over again from scratch. He had obtained a six-month leave of absence from his company. They are delighted with what they did, and they may even do it again someday. Thank you.